The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome to Views from the Sideline. It's June 23rd and look who we have here. Chris Pappas, one of the OGs of the podcast. We had to bring him back because there's a special day for Detroit Pistons fans. We'll get to that in just a moment. But there's a lot of news to talk about. There's a lot of games that we got to get to. We're into the conference finals for the NBA playoffs. Um, There's some coaching changes and yeah, there's a lot to talk about, so we're getting right into it. But first off, how are you guys doing, Chris? Haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? Doing great. I mean, I'm I'm at an all time high right now, so uh, happy to be back. Happy to be talking some sports with you guys, just like old times. Malik, how's it feel to be at home since you didn't want to join me in the studio today? <laughs> Listen, man, I, I honestly, it slipped my mind that you were going to do it at the studio. So when we when we agreed to do it on Zoom, I was like, "Okay, we're doing it on Zoom." Yeah, Joe, no, the no. traffic was terrible. Okay, no, so no worries. Back up on seventy five. It no excuses. Bad. It's fine. We just don't get to see. We don't get to feel the warmth of Malik's voice as much through Zoom <laughs> as you do through the microphone. Um, but anyway, one of the uh, head coaching positions that we've been talking about the last few episodes uh, finally got finished. Um, Boston now has a new head coach in Ime Udoka. What do you guys think about that one? Uh, I like it. I mean, Ime's been, he's been in that head coaching pursuit for the last three off seasons now, it feels like. I know he was in contention with Detroit before Casey. He was in contention for another job last summer, and now here he was with, he was in contention for Boston and then Portland. Um, so I really like the move. He was with San Antonio for so long under Popovich tutelage, then went out to Brooklyn to be an assistant over there. I think it's a great move, but we'll see. I know Brad Stevens sent out Kemba Walker in his first big trade as president of basketball operations for the Boston Celtics, but we'll see how it shakes out. So far on paper, it looks solid. Yeah. Malik, you got any opinions on it? I'm surprised they made a move so quickly. That's the biggest thing for me. Honestly, I thought they would take more time looking through candidates because it's been a while since they chose somebody when they last got Brad Stevens. And when you pick a Celtics coach, you you better get it right. Yeah, (laughs) I I think that was the weird thing for me, too, is that it was so quick when there's a lot of really good candidates. And I'm not saying Yudok is like the wrong candidate or anything, but I just thought they would have taken, I don't know, a little bit longer of a time, but. Yeah. I guess at the same time, it makes sense to get him in right away and, you know, get down to business right away as well. So I also heard a quote, too, saying that he, may, he was in contention for other jobs, too. So to sign him now while other teams are finishing up their coaching search, might as well lock him down before someone gives him a better offer. Right. And Chris mentioned the one thing that we also didn't talk about is Kemba Walker getting traded. Yeah. Uh, so Kemba Walker, Chris. Give us the breakdown because I don't remember all the details. I know it's a second round pick, Al Horford. Um, they also, so they actually also got the Celtics first round pick. So they picked number 16 uh, from the Boston Celtics as well um, in this year's draft. So they, they got, a, they got a first round pick by taking on Kemba's contract because it was longer than Al Horford's. So um, they got two picks, Kemba, and then Celtics got a later pick in this year's draft plus Al Horford. Yeah. And so that's OKC. So OKC is just now loaded with so many draft picks um, yeah. for the Pretty near much all of them. Yeah. For the yeah, near they, future, they, they have yeah. everything. Um, I think they have eight, eight draft picks in this year's draft. Crazy. <laughs> Do you think there's like some sort of way that they flip Kemba again? 
Yes, I th- I, I, I'm not sure if Kenda's going to stick there. Yeah. I mean, see who they see who they get at six. Plus, you have Shai Gilgis Alexander, who is their ball dominant player. You're going to bring Kemba off the bench. I mean, that's what you would do. Because for Shai's development, he started last year. It was great. He had a breakout season. So I wouldn't want to hinder that. I could see him if someone else wanted him. Yeah, I think they would trade him for any sort of draft capital or positive think, compensation. I don't think they'd necessarily have to bring him off the bench. Him and CP3 got along fine, even though CP3 is a more of a, of a pure point guard. But if they bring in another point guard, SGA has shown that he can mesh with somebody else well. But I think there is a chance they trade him. Or they're either trading him or, like, packaging him with some picks. They're making some type of move in this draft because they're not drafting eight players. <laughs> so something is going to be – something's going to happen. Yeah. And they're close, too, to being on the edge of being a turnaround team. They have a lot of young talent, and they in that last trade, they only gave up Moses Brown. So, I mean, they oh, still have not, a lot yeah, of young players. About Moses Brown, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so that was kind of – he was kind of a breakout player for them in the last year. Uh, so that was interesting to move on from him, but yeah. I mean, they still have a lot more young guys that they can use to package um, along with something else um, to get Kemba out of there if they want. It yeah. all depends on what they're trying to do. I mean, they're they're all for moving forward and rebuilding. That's what it, this is. It's, they're not for comp- competing essentially for a playing spot next year. Right. Um. Yeah, I think that's. Can, is there any other news that we missed? I don't think there – there hasn't been a ton lately. There's just been a lot of the coaching rumors. Yeah, I mean, Becky Hammond's a finalist. She's the first woman finalist for a head coaching job. She's a finalist with Chauncey Billups and Mike D'Antoni in Portland. Right. Um, so that'll be interesting. I think Becky gets her – I think Becky gets a job this summer between one of the – Yeah, that's what me and Malik – me and Malik had talked about last episode is that we think that she has a good chance to land somewhere. Uh, Malik brought up the magic. Do you think that would be a good fit for her? I think the magic. I for, I don't know why, but I feel like Washington would be a really good spot with Russell Beal, two guys that probably are going to get think, moved. I don't <laughs> think they will. I really, I don't think they will get moved. I think Russell and Beal are going to be there. Bradley has made it known he doesn't want to go anywhere. He's kind of like Damian Lillard of the East when it comes to that loyalty standpoint, which is good to see because you see all these players pulling the Kevin Durant trying to join up with each other. I mean, that's to me that's what's that's hard like ruined Kevin Durant for myself. Kevin Durant and James Harden teaming up with each other, I just uh, I don't like it. Yeah. So I like guys like Beal and Lillard who are like loyal to that team. I think I think Portland and Washington will be kind of weird for like hiring Becky Hammond because like in her first job and then giving her the task of handling superstars and develop because she's done a she did a really good job coaching the D League team and it was still the D League a few years ago. And it seems like she has a good grip on developing young players. That's why I think it would be better for the magic. But yeah. giving her the task of handling those stars from day one, I think it would be a lot more of a challenge. Yeah, that most it's... most young coaches might not be able to handle. Yeah, of course, of course, it's gonna be more of a challenge, but uh, we'll see. Either way, I think she's she will be good in any situation that she gets to. Yeah, she'd be prepared. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. I didn't think Chauncey was gonna go to the Boston Celtics. Yeah, I thought, I thought that he was, was gonna happen. Yeah, I, I was with you on that one. I thought he was a good candidate for for Boston, but oh well. I think he'll also get his chance too pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Chauncey, is, Chauncey is somebody Washington should. It's definitely yeah, I, 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 you know, I kind of agree with you. I think Chauncey might be a better fit in Washington. Yeah. Okay, let's it. Let's get into the uh, what I like to call the meat and potatoes of this episode, Malik. Uh, <laughs> Chris, that's his new catchphrase. Almost, if you didn't know that. Hey, the, the meat, meat and potatoes. potatoes. The meat and potatoes. Malik had oh. never. Malik said he didn't really. He's never really heard that saying all that much. Oh, really? Not a lot. I don't. I don't yeah, hear really? people say meat. I don't hear people say meat, but I've heard it before. But people don't say it as much as Joey has. <laughs> that one, that's, that that's, the main that's, thing. that's fair. I have heard the phrase before. I know what it means, but <laughs> get into the meat yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get to the meat and potatoes. <laughs> anyway, NBA draft lottery happened last night. Uh, we wanted to do the episode during the draft lottery, which would have been really fun. But we were unable to. I had to work a concert yesterday, so I was out. 
Luckily, it got over so that I did see the top five uh, picks go off. And what was it? The, the Pistons, Rockets, and um, was it the, the Magic had the top three? I was on three. Cavs and Toronto. Yeah, Toronto was four. Toronto four. No, like for odds. Oh, for oh, odds. Yeah. yeah, it was Pistons, Rockets, yeah. and Magic. Yeah. Yeah. So they all, all three teams had a 14% chance for the uh, number one overall pick. The Magic. Uh, got a little bit snubbed. They fell to the fifth spot. So then the the Raptors got to move up to four, which was cool for them. Uh, we didn't get anything crazy like the Pelicans a few years ago when they got up to get to Zion. Um, but then the Cavs fell suit at three. So then all we had left were the Pistons and the Rockets. And they put up the card for the Rockets and all of Detroit screamed. In unison, Man, listen. Pistons receive the number one overall pick in the 2021 NBA draft. Hey, I, haven't ben and it's I, haven't been, I haven't been that excited about the Pistons since I was a kid. Yeah. It's, it's literally, it's been like since like 2007 or 8. Yeah. I mean, the last time they won a playoff game was 2008. It's been that long. And that team so already it, wasn't all that great. They were already starting to fall off. 2018, that went to the conference finals? Yeah, they were already... I, I feel like they were... They overperformed a little bit. In my eyes. Maybe, maybe. I feel like they... I feel like they performed what we expected in other conference finals, but just can't get over the hump. I think that whole team was kind of uh, ruined by... shouldn't say ruined, but I think Flip Saunders could have done a better job coaching. Perhaps. But anyway, the Pistons have the number one draft pick. Cade Cunningham. Fade for Cade. I told you guys, beginning of the year. Yeah. Joey, I need you to sound more excited. I need yeah, Joey. Yeah, yeah, you, you know what? If this is the Lions getting the number one pick, <laughs> exactly. I'd be so excited. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yes. There, there would be more enthusiasm. There definitely would. Come on. Now, I'm excited. I, I am excited. Try to I, convince us that you're excited. I let, you I, let I let out a a very interesting yell the other day in the van because I was <laughs> very, I was listening to it on the way back from the the concert that I was working yesterday, and so I I heard and the number two pick goes to the Houston Rockets and I was like oh <laughs> and I was like I mean. Yeah, that's, that's good enough. I mean, I had to temper expectations because I was I was driving. I had to be careful. But <laughs> nonetheless, it's crazy because the Pistons haven't had this good of a draft pick since 2003 or four or whatever. Since the Darko. Darko. I mean, Second the last overall. Time they picked number one was 51 years ago. Yeah. 1970. I was going to say, we've never seen it. So. Yeah. And we haven't had the opportunity to get such a high caliber player in 20, what was it like 27 years? Grant Hill was 93 or 94. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys weren't even born, right? Hey, 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 95, all right? So, you know, it's pretty crazy that we can get a talented player. I, I do think that there is slight, room for it not being Cade Cunningham, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty much Cade Cunningham. That's the, that's yeah. the only thing that I don't know if it worries me because I don't, I don't know. It's a weird feeling because it's a feeling we've never had. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're still adjusting to this. Yeah. Yeah. We're not we're used yeah. to this. Yeah. There's also, <laughs> there's also a part of me that I keep hearing people talk more and more about Jalen Green lately. And I don't know if, that's just me or not, but his draft stock keeps seemingly going up. Yeah, he, yeah. He, there's a chance he goes to to Houston. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Troy Weaver really likes Jalen Green. He's part of that five. There's five players that he's going to do due diligence on. It's going to be Kate, of course, uh, Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, and Jonathan Kuminga from the G League Elite. Those would be the five that they do due diligence on. But I, I, I think it's 95% chance it's Cade. The 5% is Jalen Green. Yeah. Like he, he's that second guy. Right. Um, 
the one thing that I wanted to point out too is uh, there's been a lot of talk about like Cade Cunningham fitting into this team. And now I, again, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves about talking about what's, what the possibilities are and that Cade isn't a surefire thing. But do you guys see any problems with Cade being on this team? Like, there's been random ones like Killian and Cade clashing or no, whatever. Just, I completely, I completely disagree with that. I think it's people that haven't really watched Killian play. Exactly. Um, because Killian can play off the ball. He can play on the ball. He's a very giving pass. Like he's a distributor first. Um, he's not. He yeah. He has he he wants the ball in his hands, but he's not opposed to playing off of it. Cade Cunningham, to me, I see a lot of Grant Hill in his game. He's that type of player where he's that point forward. Yeah. He can play off the ball. He likes to play with the ball. He's. I think it's going to be actually – I think it's a really great matchup with those two players playing together. Exactly. Like, Killian, it's pass first. And then, honestly, his, de- his defense is the second most important part of his game, honestly. Yeah. Scoring is almost third. And he improved yeah. – as the season went on scoring, but that's not the most important thing about him. It's making other teammates better and then playing his butt off on the defensive end. And then Cade, Cade just does everything. Yeah, he does he be, I, yeah. absolutely everything. He's, I think he was the number one player in college basketball in points per isolation. Every single, he can get a bucket any way you want it. Uh, catch and shoot, taking guys off the dribble, going to the rack. Uh, he's not a super great athlete, but yeah. he, he is a solid athlete. He's a, it's not like a Greg Monroe type of athlete where it's like this dude doesn't even get off the floor. Um, he's got enough burst, enough burst of speed and that good first step to get to the basket and beat a defender. And then he's also a great help side defender as well. Um, there's a couple instances when he was at Oklahoma State playing off playing off ball as the ball as the point guard's penetrating to the lane. He sees it. He has good instincts, comes over and blocks the shot going straight up. So – I, I think Cade is the is the best prospect in this draft. Yeah, the, the only thing, Joey, when it comes to him maybe not living up to expectations, I think he's very good at everything. He's not at, he's not elite at one thing. That's yeah. the that's the only thing that could maybe make people think he doesn't live up to like superstar, super elite expectations. Because he's all around very good, but there's not one elite trait, which is that, that happens in drafts. There's not always the generational Zion type, sh- like, sure things, but yeah. he's, he's as close as to a sure thing as yeah. you do in this year. Yeah. I agree with that. And then also, too, to add to the fact that I, having a guy with a good mindset, I mean, we're seeing it now. There's stuff coming out about Ben Simmons maybe not having the best mindset. Um, but Kane Cunningham, he's a leader. Like, you watch him at Oklahoma yeah. State, he's a positive leader in the fact that he impacts his guys to do better. He doesn't yell at them. He doesn't do it in a negative way. He brings people up to the, up to his level, which is what you want in a player that's going to be the best player for your franchise. So I really, I think it's a win-win for Cade, who's going to get ample opportunity to handle the ball as much as he needs. Um, and then an ample opportunity for the Pistons to actually be relevant again. So uh, I think it's going to be Cade. Of course, there's that slight chance that maybe Troy does do a trade and trades back because this is a fully loaded draft. Um, I know they really, I mean, everybody loves Kate Cunningham, but I know Troy's really high on Jalen Green. He's really high on James Boot Knight out of UConn. Um, so he could trade back. He, anything's on the table. It is Troy Weaver. This guy made eight trades in one off season. I think it would take a lot to, to trade out of the number one spot. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah I agree. It, but it I just want to put it yeah. on the table. It would have to be almost like the perfect situation. And, and like I, to Golden on. State, like gold, like it would have to be like a Golden State type of offer of number seven, number fourteen, plus yeah. James Wiseman, or plus another really good player. You know, exactly. It's got to be a huge haul. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. I I think I don't think this draft is as talented as some of the other drafts. Me and Malik have t- kind of talked really? about it. I yeah. think this is going to be one of the best drafts since t- 2003. It's a, last year's draft. Last year's draft, we weren't high on it, and it ended up being one of the most well-rounded drafts in the past like 10 years. Yeah, I, I, I real, I'm, I'm, I did, I will disagree with you guys. I do think this is going to be like probably. I'm not going to say it's better than 2003, but it's really high up there. I feel like there's no way it can be better than 2003. 2003 was just it was top heavy. 
There were like four Hall of Famers in the first ten picks. Right, but even that. I mean, the top four in this draft is really good. There's it is. Th- there's three could be Hall of Famers. In, uh, you don't know what's a Hall of Famer. I mean, I did call Luka Doncic being a goat, but yeah, uh, there, there are people with Hall of Fame talent in this yeah, draft. Like Jalen yeah. Green could be an NBA leading scorer sometime down the road. He's the best yeah. scorer in the draft, um, but he's six foot five, and that's why you have hesitation there. You know. Um, and he's not, he doesn't have a huge wingspan like Kate Cunningham has. So that's why you probably lean towards Kate. But Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, he's a bona fide score leader. Anything you want to say about him. So there's huge talent in this draft, especially in the top four. Um, a lot of draft experts have said that after number four, it does take a dip, a slight dip. Um, but it's, it should be a pretty good draft. That's kind of where I'm at. I, I feel like after the four or five top guys, there becomes a lot of question marks that are a lot of unknowns. And I don't, I mean, that happens every year in the draft too, but it just seems like past those four or five guys, it's going to be really hard to judge who you want. It and seems for, like Davion Mitchell is almost like a certified top 10 pick at this point. Yeah. And you know everybody, what? Yeah, everybody loves him. And, and you know what? We, this is all before we see the players get to the league, too. It's all right. – we're all guessing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of the things for that people have against Cade Cunningham right now are because they saw him in the tournament kind of kind of falter a little bit, and he didn't look as good. The one thing that I liked about Cade Cunningham, though, is that he looked like he's a gritty player. Yeah. And yeah. if anybody knows anything about Detroit, that's – that's the thing for Detroit basketball, and that's that's kind of how we how we run the show. So if if he fits into that mold really well, the city will embrace him, the fans will embrace him, and then it'll just be awesome. I agree. He's coming into a great situation. I mean, with Dwayne Casey, who's got that type of mindset. I mean, we Isaiah Stewart has ad- has adapted that mindset in Detroit. You know, he is grit and grind to the fullest. He's he's, got, he's almost a baby Ben Wallace, Isaiah Stewart. He, he, I love Beef Stew. That's he's he's <laughs> one of my favorite pistons. Sadiq Bay is a grinder. Like that dude lights it up from beyond the arc. Yeah. And he would have passed Damian Lillard for the most threes in rookie season if we played a full season this year. Um, but he is a lockdown defender too. Like he he's he's there. Killian Hayes has that potential. He, I mean he's been he was injured last year, so we didn't really see as much, but the groundwork is there. Even Saban Lee. Saban Lee, I think, was my my favorite surprise of the season, to be honest. Saban Lee was fun to watch, yeah. So, yeah. They, I mean, you're right. They have a lot of good groundwork. Um, the, the nice thing, too, is that this upcoming season, we don't have to have any expectations again. We just, we just roll with it, see what Cade or whoever we take can do. And as long as we see improvements, I think the year after that, we're ready to hit the ground running. I agree. I think next year is still a progress year for this group. Yeah. yeah I, I, have a, I have a question for you two guys when it comes to this upcoming season. What are the odds that Jeremy Grant gets moved before the end of the season? Low. Really? You think unless, so? Unless something crazy comes up to nowhere that helps move the core forward. I mean, Jeremy Grant's 26, maybe he just turned 27. Yeah. Uh, he's there are going to be a lot of offers. There's going to be a lot of offers. I know that this is a time to sell high, but he also is part of what Detroit wants. I mean, it's very difficult to get a very good three-point shooter that's super athletic, super lengthy, great defender. Like, yeah. he fits really well, and he's going to fit better having Cade Cunningham and Killian take a next step because he doesn't have to hold the ball as much as he had to do let this past season. He can play off those guys more, which he fits better. Yeah, he'll be the number one option but for next season, but after that, it can be Cade. Or whoever Jalen Green or whoever they pick, they they got really lucky getting him after Christian Wood left because like, yeah, every, everything Troy we Troy Weaver pulled off in his first season was almost miraculous for this <laughs> franchise. And you know what? Even it, for myself, I questioned getting Mason Plumley over Christian Wood, but it worked out because Isaiah Stewart was able to start to develop. So exactly, I have no, I can't question Troy Weaver and whatever moves he makes. He it's all working. Nailed every single one. Yeah. I yeah. still believe they should have moved on from Plumlee at the deadline of this year, though. <laughs> well, what I mean, offers do you think are for Plumlee, honestly? You do need well, call. You do need just call something. centers, though. That's what I'm saying. You you need to keep two or three veterans. You do. To, uh, to I, so I agree with Malik. 
to help to help shape those young guys. Yeah, and he and Mason mm-hmm. Plumlee is a good guy to have for that. Nah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so Malik, are you saying the trade Jeremy Grant next trade deadline? You're saying. Or before I, this I season just, starts, I, I was just—I think there's a really good chance because there are going to be so many offers, especially if he produces again like he did this past season. Going going into the playoffs next season, there are going to be teams that are going to be looking for that one player that takes them over the top or mm-hmm. gives them that, that extra punch. Because last year, Jeremy Grant was the extra punch for the Nuggets. So there's going to be another team going in that has a slight chance that's going to push hard for him. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think that the the likelihood is actually pretty high too. Um, I'm I have like mixed feelings about Jeremy Grant because as good of a season as he had, the second half of the season for him was pretty rough. Um, he, I know he, has, he had some injuries. Yeah, he was, yeah, right. he was in and out of the lineup. Yeah, but they at the same time, to take a little bit. At the same time, he was a little. I don't know. He, I think. It'll be interesting to see, I guess, once Cade or whoever gets here because that's going to take the load off of Jeremy, and I think that he fits better as not a number one option. Yeah, he, I, he is, he is better as, like, the third guy, but it's going to take time for them to get there. Yeah. And but, you know what? We, I'm not even – I think Jeremy still has room to improve. Like yeah. him being the number one option this past season was great for his development. I think he can take another step next season where Cade and Jeremy can play off each other. Um, so I, I, I don't think they're going to trade Jeremy. I think it, ha- it would have to be a very, very big offer and an overbuy by another team for them to, to move him. Yeah. But I, I'm with Malik though. I think that that could happen. I, I think some team possible, is going to get desperate. Yeah. He's on a good contract. I mean, he's got he's on a great contract for what he does and what he brings to a team. He, I mean, and then the team's going to be desperate. I mean, what well, about we even heard from like the Celtics this past season that they the Celtics yeah. really wanted to get Jeremy Grant. Now they never actually ended up making the move for it, but it sounded like they were close a couple times. The the, the, the thing with the Celtics is just. Now, what does Brad Stevens want? Because it's a totally different brain trust. Right. Exactly. Um, but yeah, but yeah, uh, there could be a huge offer that comes by that we just don't expect, and Troy Weaver will just have to make that move. But I would say it's low, but you never know. It's the NBA; anybody can be traded at any moment. That's not named LeBron James. Yeah, I agree. What do you guys think about? Oh, we haven't talked. Well, we'll talk about it once we get to the Philly stuff. Okay. Um, is there any other notes you guys want to talk about for the, the lottery portion? I do have one stat for you guys I need to talk about. Wait, wait, um, is, it, is this the Jalil Okafor? This is, the, this is my Jalil Okafor stat of the day for you. <laughs> I'll get to it after you. After you. All right. So, person on Reddit posted middle of the season last year um, saying how the Pistons were going to get the number one overall pick in 2021. And this is why. Uh, it goes as It goes as follows. In 2015, Jaleel Okafor joined the Sixers. In 2016, the Sixers got the number one pick. In 2018, he joined the Pelicans. In 2019, the Pelicans got the number one pick. Oh, my God. In 2020, he joins the Pistons. And right now, we have the worst record in the league. And the Pistons got the number one pick. So, I think we keep Jaleel Okafor for another year. You just sign him back to that that minimum, whatever he needs to be paid. And let's get uh, Imoni Bates next year, you know? So, he only did it. Was he on the Sixers that those three years or whatever? In between the Sixers and Pelicans, did he stay on the, the Sixers that whole time? Was he on the Sixers? I thought he was just there for two years. I thought he was there for two years. That's what yeah, I thought, too. I think he was just two. So re-signing him doesn't do anything. We can just get rid of him. He already did his yeah, job. Yeah, he did his job. We got some yeah. yeah, you're a good call. We can give somebody but else the number one pick. So interesting, though. Yeah. yeah but that's happening I also sometimes. I wanted to bring up the Warriors having two lottery picks. Yeah. I'm really interested in what they do with those if they now, move somebody. Yeah, do do they make a move to Portland or Washington? I know Washington wants Beal there, but if they offer you James Wiseman, number seven and number fourteen, I just make that deal at that moment. You know, you can or, restart your franchise. Or do the Warriors package seven and fourteen exactly to move up, and then now they also have. They they technically they're gonna get Clay back. They're gonna have Steph Clay and Draymond still. 
but then they'll have Wiseman and another top five pick that can put them in a rebuild whenever they need to as well. So yeah, that it all depends on what what players drop and what pick they can move up to by combining the right, four team. Right. But it, then that just allows the Warriors to do something where it's like a, a quick rebuild turnaround kind of deal. And then also, too, we saw in the lottery with Toronto jumping into the top four um, that dropped the Chicago Bulls to the number eight spot, which conveyed that pick to the Orlando Magic. So the Magic actually worked. They got another lottery pick from this Nikola Vucevic deal, which conveyed this offseason. So good for the Magic. I mean, they've been in lottery turmoil for the past five years so um it's good to see hopefully they can start to develop that and can we talk about the cleveland cavaliers just constantly having lottery luck just i mean they move up in every single lottery at this point what have they done with but, it? i was about to say uh, oh i agree i agree yeah. but what do they do at five if the best player is jalen suggs then you have to take him and make a move and trade sexton or garland I mean, to be, I think, to be fair, though, the, the sex and stuff, people have already been talking about them moving on from him. Like, Cleveland fans don't like him, I guess. But, I mean, yeah, I, I've heard there's some mixed stuff about just he's a ball hog. He's right. plain and simple. He's a ball hog. Uh, he has a great mentality, it seems like, but he just pounds the, the heck out of the ball. Yeah. Um, I think Cleveland's going to – I think we could see a couple moves for Cleveland, like Kevin Love getting traded. It's good that he joined Team USA for Cleveland because – Otherwise, he has zero trade value. What if Cleveland? What if Philly sent Ben Simmons to Ben Simmons to Cleveland? That's interesting, because that I didn't think about that. But if you package Kevin Love and let's say Darius Garland and the number three pick, does Cleveland make that deal? I think they do. Why not? Why not? At, at this point, you've been again in lottery turmoil for so long. Ben Simmons is elite in everything but shooting just and take offense. a chance and often he's good at attacking the basket and passing the ball yeah. he's, we'll he's, he just, he's 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 he's, he's terrified good. now and um, that has to be fixed. His, his mentality his mentality was changed this offseason it's in this playoffs but in the regular season ben simmons he's a great attacker great slasher elite passer for corner threes like he's he was the number one point guard for assists in quarter threes, which is a great stat for today's NBA. Um, I think if you're Cleveland, you just take you, – I think a lot of teams will actually be in the Ben Simmons market. Yeah. Um, and I think they'll actually get still get decent value for him because he's 25, he's 6'10", uh, and he's elite at everything but shooting. Um, I think yes, there are questions. I think yeah, people I, I think people are going to lowball, though, for Ben Simmons now. They're gonna to try to low ball, but then there's gonna be so many offers that start piling in that I think they'll just get they'll they'll get enough value for it. If anything, have, if anything though, I would say I like putting him in Cleveland. Just let, put him in timeout for a few years and <laughs> see what happens. I can. What about San Antonio? Yeah, I keep San hearing Antonio. that one too, but I don't know. I like Deion, Dejounte Murray and his uh, development, yeah. so yeah, I wouldn't want to throw that off and. I don't know. San, Anto- San Antonio's in a weird spot already. I feel yeah. like for their team that they'd be better off almost just restarting. When is Pop going to retire? In the next five years, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. I also want to say it's hilarious and sad that Minnesota fell out the lottery. <laughs> Min- you know, I don't it's, like yeah. Carl Anthony Towns. Like his, I don't know what it is about him. He's so talented. He's just so soft. Like, I'm sorry. I just... The dude, I don't know if he's ever going mean, to be part of a winning team at this point. When, I don't. when, you, when you're in Minnesota, I feel like there's – there. What about when Jimmy Butler was there and they made the playoffs? And Jimmy, Jimmy Butler tried, would be – Jimmy was the – Jimmy and Thibodeau were the only reason. Exactly. There was the only reason. Jimmy Jimmy tried to get them to play up to his comp, – like his comp, competing level. And Carl's just too soft. I don't know. I don't like Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell together. I know some people are like, oh, I think they're going to take the next step. Next season, they're probably not so. taking the next step. I don't, up. I don't think so. Yeah. I like, I do like Anthony Edwards though. Yeah. I think Anthony Edwards is a stud. I don't like the rest of that team. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, let's get into the games. Um, we got to talk about the Hawks Sixers game seven since we were talking about Ben Simmons. Who boy, the uh, the Hawks took down the Sixers in game seven. They're moving on to the Eastern Conference Finals to play the Bucks. 
I don't know if anybody really saw that coming. As much as I like the Hawks, I didn't think they were going to be able to do that. Me neither. And the best part about it was my man, Kevin Herter, saving the Hold day up. for Atlanta. Kevin Herter pulled a D-Wade game, you know. He, yeah. Dwayne, he, he loves Dwayne Wade. That was, that was his favorite player growing up. Yeah. He, was, he, was getting, yeah. he was getting in the lane, getting tough buckets. No, it, it was fun to see. It's This team, this Atlanta Hawks team is so fun to watch because they love playing with each other. And they just have a great, like, continuity with each other. And Danilo Gallinari hitting big buckets when mm-hmm. Trey is off. Like, just seeing this team come together is so much fun. And Ice Trey playing the villain in every single arena. That's that's the team I'm rooting for. Yeah, I mean, they, I don't think they're going to make the finals, but yeah. I'm rooting for them. They, are, think- they, are, they are so mentally tough. Like, they are... To me, they're the toughest team left, and Trey Young is the toughest player left in the playoffs. Who would have thought, man? This is a coming out yeah. party for that Hawks franchise, what, biggest what, turnaround yeah. in sports. Whatever you throw at them, they they're gonna punch back. Yeah, I and yeah, I keep saying, saying? I, I just keep saying to I've been saying to Malik the last couple episodes. I was I'm upset that I was one year like a year off of my prediction of saying that the Suns and the Hawks were gonna be good. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. missed it by like a year. Yeah, you, you were close with it. But but and then the other thing with the Hawks too is like when was the last time we saw such a turnaround in a NBA season? They're 14 and 20 half through halfway through the year. They fire their head coach, promote an interim head coach. Yes, it's Nate McMillan who's had experience which worked out to their benefit. But then they go on this tear where they're 27 and 11 to end the season. And now they're in the Eastern Conference Finals. I, I have no words for this, but it's Eastern, so much fun to watch. The Eastern Conference Finals part is crazy, but honestly, I felt like they, they had either the second best or best offseason out of any team with their signings and all the moves they made. And we expected them to come out playing really well. They played well at first, and then they kind of fell off. But they had to develop chemistry. They had injuries. Cam Reddish got hurt. They had to figure out the DeAndre Hunter of it all. Okongwu, they had to figure that out too. And then I yeah, I just think they're a couple of years ahead of schedule that we didn't expect. Like I was gonna say we thought they would be a borderline playoff team this year, but they're in the conference finals. Like this is two years probably ahead of schedule. I was gonna say pe- people forget they they're playing without DeAndre Hunter. And he was yeah. playing great early on in the season for them. So he played great in the Knicks series. Yeah. So if, I mean, they, if they had if they had DeAndre Hunter, I'd give them a real chance to beat the Bucks. Yeah. But unfortunately, he's out for the rest of the playoffs. I mean, I'm not doubting him. Uh, I'm. A, I'll give you guys my predictions for these two series. I'll give you. I'm taking the Bucks in seven because I. I'm not gonna take out like. Uh, take out the Hawks in any of this, and then I'll take the Suns in six. I think it's gonna be Bucks. Bucks Suns, and that'll be fun. It'll be really fun to have a new team winning a championship. I, I think everybody's rooting for Suns Hawks, but. I think this is where Trey Young is going to show that he's not ready yet for like yeah. full on time. Yeah, because yeah. because he still has his his inefficiencies. And the nice thing about yeah. that game seven was he did play like pretty bad for the most part. He had some good passes uh, to save them, and he did hit a big three late in the game. So at least he stayed confident. But when you're taking that many shots and they're not falling on those nights, it's really going to hurt your team sometimes. And I think that's going to happen in this series because you're going to have Drew Holiday all over you. Yeah, the one thing with the Hawks, too, in that game seven is Trey Young was playing badly from an offensive standpoint, but he kept the pace really well. He kept it in the Hawks' favor, right. which ha- helped their offense keep flowing. When you have Drew Holiday hounding you, I'm not sure that's going to be the same. Yeah, and I also yeah. think, like, we just saw Joel Embiid tear up, like, Clint Capella and stuff. There's no way that they're going to be able to stop Giannis either. So that part of it is going to be difficult. And as much as I love Kevin Herter, I don't think he's going to be able to do that on a nightly basis as much as like Chris Middleton or something. So for the Hawks, I don't know if their their second best player is going to be able to step up enough times for the Bucks, uh, second or third best player. Yeah. So. We need to talk about the Sixers for a minute, and I'd like to jump on Ben Simmons first. Can I do that? All right, yeah, yeah, you go first. You take the lead. So, I don't think it's a stretch to say this is the biggest failure 
of developing a number one pick in in NBA history. Wait, wait. Since Markel Fultz in Philadelphia. No, I can't ben, say since Markel ben, Fultz. Because, I still think Ben Simmons is a bigger talent than Markel Fultz. I can't say since Markel Fultz because Markel's in, Markel's shoulder was almost like it was. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I forgot about yeah. It, that was just unlucky. What about this Anthony right Bennett? Here, this. Yeah, Bennett was bad too. But Bennett, ben, I don't think deserves to be a number one pick. Ben Simmons is a LeBron James level Hall of Fame talent. Yes, I agree with you. And in his fifth year, he averaged 14 points and seven rebounds. The, the Sixers organization didn't push him. They babied him. He didn't work on his own game. They failed him and he failed himself. Yep. And then Doc Rivers actually came out. This, this might be the most embarrassing thing I've ever heard an NBA coach say. He told everybody, if you think I should sit Ben Simmons, you don't know basketball. That's what he said to us. <laughs> That is that is what he told all of us to our faces. And then and, now they're and, then, the <laughs> and then in the post game press conference after game seven, someone asked, Do you think Ben Simmons can be a starting point guard for an NBA championship winning franchise? He said, I can't answer that question right now. Like he said it and he, even worse. Even worse. Ben Simmons in his last press conference, his last words were, I am who I am and it is what it is. Yeah, and he's he, he the worst this part is, too is he was saying that he needs he struggled and he needed to work on some stuff. You're saying that after game seven, you had six other games to correct it, and I, that's Joey, what on TNT that's what Shaq kept saying. And Shaq said some expletives, but he said that you know if my teammate said that to me to me, then we would have had to talk. And I get it, is, like he's supposed to be at least their second best player on the team. And he's just now realizing he wasn't playing good enough. It's been five years, Joey. It yeah. has been five years. Like mm-hmm. Elton Brand was an all-star power forward and he's done nothing <laughs> to help Ben Simmons. Nothing, yeah. nothing. Brett, Brett Brown at least tried to make him be more aggressive. And he averaged his most points like his first two seasons, two or three seasons. And then nothing. Just it, I would it's, say it's, too. It's the worst. Like it's the worst handling of a Hall of Fame talent I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, but I I would say it, again, it's five years in. It's on him at this point. Like it is, it he's is not. Definitely, you're yeah. not. You're not going to be able to change the personality of a player anymore as a coach or anything because Ben Simmons has this this predetermined mind that you know he is who he is, just like he said. And yeah. nobody's going to be able to change that. He's going to do it. So that's on him at that point. And, you know, and at the same time, like a coach can be like, hey, you need to be more aggressive. That's all they can say. And they can't. The NBA is not a league where you can just punish people. It's not college or anything. It's like you have to play him. Like he's their second best player. Do, even if, I'm sorry. You don't you don't have to, Joey. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah, you do. I mean, unless you want to trade him for nothing at that point, because then you're going to have, you're going to have a disgruntled player and then he's going to leave and walk for free. And that's, that's been the problem though. How do you not hold him accountable ever? How, ever? What do you want to, what do you want to do though? What do you, how do you want to hold him accountable? Force him to shoot. And if he doesn't shoot, sit him. Okay. And and then from the higher ups, of the organization are not going to be happy. And as a coach, you could lose your job. I'm and not, you have to, I'm you not saying, have and I'm not saying that I disagree with you. Cause I, I would love for Ben Simmons to just sit and learn his lesson, but I'm just saying the business aspect of it. I don't think really allows for that. That's, also, why, I said, that's why I said the organization failed him too. Well, you also have to play the fact him. too, that agents, if you see, if you treat your, that player a certain way, and his agent doesn't like that. And he, he, his agent is Rich Paul, which is the most powerful agent in sports right now. Right. And then he has a lot of power to say, oh, you don't want to go to that franchise. Like, there's a lot of these business things that, as much as it would be like, oh, I would love for, if you bet, if you don't shoot, we're just going to sit you. I, I completely agree with that mindset. It's finding a balance and finding someone that he'll actually listen to opposed to being like, do this or you sit. Yeah. And, so, at, the, and at the same time, would he really care? You know, he's got a fat contract. 
he is dating a yeah, Kardashian, good. and you know he's just living oh, did life. He get dumped? No, he got dumped. Did he? Yeah, because now she's dating Devin Booker. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh Jesus! I, I get <laughs> all that. Can actually shoot. I get them all mixed up. But anyway, um, what 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 they what that organization did with Ben Simmons is there should almost be a thirty for thirty about what ha- what has happened in these past five years. It is insane. I mean, also at the end of the game seven, Joel Embiid even said the game turned when we passed up on an open dunk. Exactly. Like this is a broken relationship. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting how it all works out. Mm-hmm. It's a shame. It's really a shame. All around. It is. Yeah, it is. Do you guys it, think, I, I, I think Doc Rivers has lost touch too. Yeah. yeah. Doc Rivers, I think is, I think he's, he's like a Mike Budenholzer. He's got to go. I was going to say, uh, I got a couple questions. Malik, do you think it's more on Ben Simmons or the organization? And I'm not going to hound you for whatever you say, but I'm just curious. What do you think played a bigger factor? I am honestly going to say it was more more in the organization. It's more in the organization. Chris, how do you feel? I think it's a perfect storm. Because I don't think Ben Simmons works hard, and I think he's been babied since he entered the league by not only the organization, but his circle. So I think it's a mixture of both. I know it's kind of a cop-out answer, but I really believe that it's the people he surrounds himself with mixed with the organization babying him as soon as he got into the league, mixed with he doesn't have a great work ethic or a, a wants to improve on his deficiencies because he's good enough right now. So – it's going to have to be a t- change in mindset for him. Will that happen? That's a question mark that all these NBA GMs have to make a decision on if they're going to pursue a trade because he could just be this guy for the rest of his career. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was listening to an interview, Charles Barkley. He was on a local Philadelphia radio station and they asked him about like, if he like had seen the, like these qualities in Ben Simmons, he said like three years ago, at a Sixers practice when when Brett Brown was still the coach, there was a scrimmage they had that was like well over like 30 minutes long. And Ben Simmons never took a shot. He he never shot. He just he he passed the ball around and ran around and did what Ben does. And at the end of it, they looked up and they said, Has Ben taken a single shot? And they were like, No. And nobody did anything about it. They just allowed it to happen. Yeah. And uh, did they just think it was going to be fixed, just yeah. randomly? It's crazy. I mean, they probably just they probably just hope that he would take it upon himself to realize he's not a great shooter and just work on it j- just somewhat over each off season. But it just hasn't happened. Yeah, it's gotten worse. Yeah, crazy, unfortunate. Okay, uh, other question: Do you think Doc Rivers is going to be here next season? Yes, I actually think he is. He's got too much money on the line. They're not yeah. going to want to pay. I kind of think so, too. I think they give him about one more year, to be honest. They improved a lot as a team and with him as the coach in this first year. Now, they improved a lot. I mean, Doc Rivers has had so many epic playoff collapses that you kind of, it's kind of in the back of your mind of, is he the right guy? Yeah. But having Ben Simmons fail at an epic level, I think also gives him some safety in the fact that Ben Simmons is kind of the guy that everybody blames right now. Yeah. So – um, I think it, from a business and organizational standpoint, their main thing will be, what do we do with Ben Simmons this off season? And if they fail again, then it's Doc maybe isn't the right guy for us. Or if they start extremely bad, but I don't expect them to start extremely bad next season. Yeah. I was gonna them, say- them, not, them not making a move for James Harden or Kyle Lowry really came back to bite them. Yeah, they could have got the James Harden deal done. Exactly. They, they would be in the conference finals. If they got if they got Kyle Lowry, I think they would have been in the conference finals. I think it's Absolutely. simple as that. Absolutely. Okay. I think yeah. Final question on the Sixers: Will Ben Simmons be a Sixer by the start no. of the season? Nope. <laughs> Don't think so. You, nope. you can't you can't fix that. You can't fix that. The Philly fans hate him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And they have reason to. Yeah, I, I think it's time for him to get a new change of scenery. L.A. perhaps. Oh no! <laughs> Absolutely. Come not. on, Malik. <laughs> How? What kind? What would a Ben Simmons to LA trade look like? 
I don't. I, I don't even know what that would look like. Kyle Kuzma, because Lakers fans hate him. You'd have to sign and trade Devin, Dennis Schroeder. Um, uh, Taylor and Horton Tucker. Taylor Horton Tucker. And then they don't have any draft capital. I know. They, you can't. If it, like you can't do it unless nobody else gets you can offer for Ben. Simmons. That would be an There's extremely no dumb trade. I just like the idea of Ben Simmons or Russell Westbrook going to LA because I think they would well, be I, terrible. It'd be terrible like, for the team. He just wants to see the Lakers' empire fall. Uh, maybe. He wants it all to burn. Yeah. LeBron will be a Laker until Bronny gets drafted, and then he'll join whatever so team Bronny's on. That's I'm so fine. tired of hearing that. That's, that, that's what's gonna happen, though. I firmly believe that the last season LeBron plays will be. Bronny's rookie year, and he will join whatever team Bronny is on, and then after that, retire. Oh, like that, that would that's be so, it. That would be so weird. It's it, I don't see the point in that. I, he I, wants I, to play. He wants to be the first for LeBron. He, yes, he's one of the greatest players of all time, but he also loves to have his name in name in the media. He does. He cares about legacy so much. It's gonna be. It is legacy, and if he get, he's the first father son duo. That's another thing on his legacy. Another thing people will remember LeBron by, which I'm not a LeBron hater, unless when he was playing the Cavs and destroyed the Pistons. But I firmly think that's what's going to happen. It's going to be 20 seasons too. But so rookie year for Bronny would be not next year or the year after, be the year after that, which would be. 20 he's not going to be a one and done player. Yes, he will. Yes, he he's, will. He's yes, not going to. Malik, Malik. Yes, he will. Do you, do you think he's going to get drafted top five just because his name is? Jay? No, 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 no. Not. I, I don't know about top five. He's. That's what I'm saying. All, but he, if you look at the ESPN ranks, he's all. He's already a ranked player. He's he's like a he's like a top fifty player, but he's not like. I think he's, he's not top twenty five, dude. Player. I, I think he's top twenty five though. But he's he's talented enough that he could go one and done. It just depends on how it shakes out. I think if he is anywhere borderline first round, he's one and done. Think about the person he comes. Think think about where he comes from. All Family, right, I, we got to stop talking about Bronny James on this show. I can't talk <laughs> yeah. about any Joey, of the James. I was just getting out of red. Come we on. we got a Western Conference Finals to talk about real quick because we only have a few minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, Clippers and Suns Western Conference Finals. Suns take a two zero lead. We didn't talk about Game One, but we don't really need to. The Suns kind of just took control. Game Two is what well, we need you, to talk you, about. You got to mention the Devin Booker game. Well, you gotta mention what yeah. he did. Yeah, forty point triple double. Come on, man. great show one by D Book. Yeah. Um, but can we talk about playoff P disappearing at the end of game two oh, and then turning oh, back into man. pandemic P? <laughs> like this is both those free throws Ugh. with the game in his hand. Yeah. I am sorry. Uh, Paul Jordan is extremely talented, but I don't know if he's got he's got it, man. I don't know for those big moments. Woof. Yeah, something is going on with that man. Um. Dang. It was crazy because that whole game was back and forth for the most part. Uh, Devin Booker was out of sorts because he got smacked in the face. Um, and then that pass, to be honest, everybody kept talking about DeAndre Ayton at the end of the game. Jay Crowder put that pass on a line. It was like it was like a centimeter away from the side of the backboard. Yeah. Also, the fact that Demarcus Cousins didn't angle his body towards the hoop also gave him a great angle to the basket. Like Demarcus Cousins has no business being on the dang floor because he doesn't. First of all, he doesn't even play defense. He's. I'm sorry. Yeah, but they, Demarcus Cousins no, is a chump now. No, he's they, there for he's there for offense. No, he ha- he had to be there because of the the review. Or yeah, because of, yeah, because of because oh yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, right. so they got it wasn't a timeout, so they couldn't take him out. Yeah, so yeah. the so the Clippers got into an unfortunate spot where they had to leave Demarcus Cousins and uh, did they have Zubac on the floor at that time too? Oh, yeah. they tried. I remember they did. They were trying to get Zubac in, but they couldn't. No, I don't know. Zubac was in there. No, no. Yeah, they had like two big there. guys in, which was yeah, yeah, really was. awkward for them. They should have um, put Zubac on because the ball because they tried to have Reggie Jackson in the game for the longest time, and then. They finally realized after all that the last reviews, minute was so te- that last minute was so terrible because of the refs and the reviews. Well, they said was, the last thirty three seconds of the game were or the last minute of the game or something was like thirty minutes long. Listen, just just that la- that last Clippers possession, where it took them like five minutes to figure out who was supposed to be on the court and where do they inbound the ball. Well, that's why I was it, saying because they were having they kept putting in guys that weren't in before the reviews and stuff. So they're trying to like, was trying to pull a fast one. Yeah. <laughs> so it was all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and now the value is famous. 
the value. <laughs> and that very well could just end the series right there because the Clippers lost the opportunity to tie it up and make it things interesting. Now the Suns are up 2-0. We got confirmation that CP3 is going to play in game three. The Suns could almost sweep them, I think. There's a chance. I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen because they've been down 0-2 in each of the first two series. Exactly. I, think, I think it'll be competitive. I think the, the Clippers were close in game one. Yes, the Suns broke away at the second half of the fourth quarter, but then they choked away game two. I think it'll be competitive, even with I, Kawhi. Kawhi is out for game three. I was going to say, with the Kawhi thing, it kind of evened the, the teams out, and I think that's why games were close. Now that the Suns are getting a guy like CP3 back, I think that just tilts the scales into the Suns' favor. Whereas you have your top two guys and the Clippers don't. Hoping he if he if he can shake off the rust in those in that first quarter, then the, the Suns, they should have no problem. They should be off and running. But it is gonna be competitive. The Clippers have played really good even with Kawhi out like all of these games. Yeah. Yeah, because former Pistons Reggie Jackson and Marcus Morris have been solid. Luke Kennard. He had a good game Luke, too. Luke is, I, he had, he did have a good game, but that dude's making way too much money for what he contri- contributes to that team. Hey, he told you guys should have been Donovan Mitchell. Should have been Donovan Mitchell. We we we're not bringing that up. We're not. Oh, it's still that up to this, day, this ain't the time. This ain't the time. We can go right, over that right. on the good time. Good times in Detroit during the draft phases. We can talk about all the failed drafts of the yeah, past. Yeah, we're gonna have to. That's a lot. Um. So, Chris, you said that you think this series is going to go to six games. That's yeah, what you said before. I got, I got, I got Suns in six. I think the Clippers will even it up in L.A. Suns will win game five, and then Chris Paul and D-Book will close it out in six. Uh, I don't think Kawhi's coming back. I don't think Kawhi's coming back. Yeah, I don't either. Um, just while you're here, what? Is, who do you think is going to win the championship? Who's going to take it all? Phoenix. I'm going Phoenix. I, th- I think Phoenix is there. They're in such like their yeah. chemistry is so great. They're so well coached. They're fun to watch too. Yeah, yeah. CP3 uh, fully healthy is like a, a tough matchup for every point guard. Yeah, they, yeah. they remind Our me Phoenix. of the the pre KD Warriors. To be honest, the way that they move the ball and everything, it's just fun to watch that team. Yeah, I agree with you. And they get they, they, yeah, they, like campaign is. I mean, he's probably even even more so. But if you guys remember, like, Sean Livingston used to be kind of that guy for the, the Warriors yeah. that, like, people kind of forget about, and he would just have big games. Campaign kind of felt that way. Yeah. yeah. So, it's pretty exciting. Um, any other things in this final wrap-up? Jeremy, Jeremy, Grant, Jeremy Grant's on Team USA. Okay, you can't, can't miss that. I mean, it's 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 kind of it's important for him. It's not important. For I mean, us, I guess right? it, he's not going to play a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, I guess he probably will play a lot because they'll blow him out. But he might score. Like, he might score like four points the whole time. I'm cool with it. Bring home a gold medal. <laughs> I guess he's there to cheer on. US. <laughs> Get some good coaching from Pop. It'll be good for his development. Maybe we'll see. All right. Well, Chris, I appreciate you. Coming on, we obviously had to do a little bit more of a special episode with the Pistons getting the number one pick. Um, we will see in about a month's time what they do with that pick, yeah. but it's definitely made Detroit fans very, very excited for the future. Yeah, and we'll have to do a draft special heading into the draft this year too. Yeah, we'll go over some good stuff. Do a, do a mock draft. Yeah, we can do a whole preview and everything. Malik, any any final thoughts? Man, I'm just I'm just happy CP3 is back. Uh, I love seeing him win, and I'm I'm still processing this number one pick, man. This yeah. this is different. Crazy. This is this is my first time as an adult being like really positive about the Pistons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice. First to time see. in the last five years we've been positive about a Detroit team. Yeah, yeah. it's insane. It's insane. Man. All right. Well, this has been views from the sideline. We will see you guys next time. And that's the meat and potatoes, folks. Pistons 2022 champs. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Kate Cunningham, Baker Cade. I can't deal with you guys. <laughs>